We are studying the book of Proverbs together. We are in the 19th chapter, and we begin this morning with the 18th verse. We want to try to get down through 22, five Proverbs this morning. 18 of chapter 19. Discipline your son, for surely there is hope, and to killing him do not set your desire. 19. A hothead who incurs a penalty, surely if you deliver him, you will do so again. 20. Listen to counsel, receive discipline, so that you may be counted among the wise in your final destiny. 21. The plans of the heart of a person are many, but as for the counsel of the Lord, it will take place, or your translation probably has, it will stand. And here's our final one, 22. What we desire in a person is his unfailing kindness. That's our word hesed. Covenant faithfulness, covenant loyalty, loving kindness. 26 different ways to write it in English. Better a poor person than a liar. Here's the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs this morning. Verse 18. Life or death proposition for the Father. The life or death proposition for the Father. 19. The man who never changes. The man who never changes. 20. Listening for living and for glory. Listening for living and for glory. And 21, wisdom is to desire His will. Wisdom is to desire His will. Finally, 22, the best condition in life is dependence on the Lord. The best condition in life is dependence upon the Lord. Well, here are our Proverbs beginning with verse 18 this morning. Discipline your son. And this second line in our proverb is very, very difficult. Uh, you may have, don't be intent on killing him. Or the King James reads, don't set your heart upon. The idea is that our children are not naturally wise. They have to be instructed. They have to be trained. That is what the book of Proverbs is all about. The lack of training in wisdom is what happened to David and David's household. It brought several to death. Upon the family, and particularly the second generation, ignominy and reproach. Now, most of the Proverbs that we have encountered have been the father addressing the son, and it assumes, and we have taught it this way, that both parents together are involved in teaching wisdom in the household. But this proverb, uh, all of the commentators make a resounding point that in 1918, this proverb makes no such assumption. Uh, it's not Father's Day on the calendar, but it is Father's Day in the Proverbs. This one is for you. All the men of Believer's Chapel should draw nigh 
to hear this word. Our top line begins with the bold command. Look at that. Discipline. Discipline your son, which is the son or the daughter in the home. Discipline, of course, is applying the mind to what has already been taught. Fear God. That's what they've been taught. Fear God, Proverbs 1.7. Fear Him above everything else in life. That is the practical application. That is, in the Old Testament, your relationship, your daily walk, what is called your way. To love the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 6, with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. It is what the New Testament explains as discipline in the apostles, teaching, walking in a regenerated spirit of the soul. That's Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. Now with this command, here it is, and its motivation to do so. For surely there is hope. Now our word hope in the top line, the lexicon translates it as things hoped for, referring to an outcome. It got me to thinking. Perhaps that was the thought of the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews when he was defining faith for us. Remember Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1? Now faith is the assurance, and there could be the word, that set his mind in motion. The things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. You set before your household the teaching, the instruction. And then we pray. We pray that the seed that we planted by instruction, by training, would be watered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now at some point, the child in the home says, what type of character do I really want to become? Dan Fogelberg's song, The Leader of the Band, a song of dedication and praise to his father, a quiet man of music, denied a simpler fate. He tried to be a soldier once, but his music wouldn't wait. He learned his love through discipline, a thundering velvet hand. His gentle means of sculpting souls took me years to understand. The leader of the band is tired and his eyes are growing old, but his blood runs through my instrument and his song is in my soul. My life is a poor attempt to imitate the man. I'm just a living legacy to the leader of the band. You see, the child in the home says, I hate the hypocrisies for which I was raised, the inconsistency of my parents, and I'm going to go one direction. And the child, or the other child, goes to appreciate the home for which he was raised, the blessings that he inherited because he was born there. It's our daily prayer that by the grace of God, that He and He alone would finish the work that you and your wife first started. Now here is line two. Not a contrast. I want you to see that. Not a contrast, but. Rather, it's an and. And that's very important because it combines the two lines together, underscoring and clarifying what is really at stake here in the proverb. It's wisdom. It's the skill for living. Which God declares is a life or death proposition in the Proverbs. It's a reminder of Moses' words on the plains of Moab in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life 
and death. The blessings and the curse. So choose life. Now listen to this purpose. That you may live and your descendants with you. Now, may I remind you fathers and the men of this church that it was Achan, son of Carmi, who heard those very words, that sermon from Moses' lips. And yet, he took the bar of gold from Jericho after hearing that sermon. And in disobedience to the command of Joshua, he brought death to himself and to his entire household. Now, I'm not going to dismiss that as a proposition. I want you to see it. I want you to see it in your mind's eye. Here is the family now huddled together and the tribes of Israel now encircle them. And we say, well look, there's little Charlie, five years old. And he's clinging to his sister Julie, eight. And look at the fear in Achan's face, in his wife's face as the people of Israel pick up stones to bring their death. It's the same picture that you have of Zedekiah, the king, 1 Kings 25. The last thing King Zedekiah saw was his son slain before his eyes. And then Nebuchadnezzar took his eyes out as a reminder to him of what he just saw. So killing the son in the, pro in the proverb would be in effect, according to Solomon, not teaching him, not instructing him, not training him in the truth. And that falls upon all of the men of this church. All of us. Killing the father, a fellow participant, in seeing the child's death. That's why Derek Kidner, the Cambridge scholar, called this proverb, deadly larceny. Do not... Is the negative command to set one's desire. Unwittingly, we come about... It comes about due to a lack of energy, a lack of effort. Fight passivity. That's the point. Not staying on wisdom is the main thing. Often in life, practically speaking, it becomes the last thing. We get so enamored and caught up with the accomplishments and the activities of our children and our grandchildren and Truth becomes the last proposition that we really think about. And yet, it's the main thing. You see, we're working with the proposition that the child never remains in neutral. He's always moving one direction or the other. Always moving spiritually. So discipline here in the proverb is love for the child leading him at the appropriate time to make his own wise decisions when he has grown up. Do you love your children? Do you love your grandchildren? Do you take it upon yourself as a believer at Believer's Chapel to look at these little ones and consider your appropriate place in their teaching and their instruction. At this tender time, this vulnerable time of their lives, you make sure that the Word of God is on your lips. 
You're teaching them. You're training them. You're instructing them. And what are you doing? You're telling them to choose life and not death. And that's the proverb. Here's 19. A hothead, literally, it's great of wrath. Your translation, I'm sure, reads something very similar. He incurs a penalty. People who are characteristically angry contain with themselves, within themselves a certain punishment. Now, in the book of Proverbs, what we have is a nexus. Um, let's think of it this way. Three points. We're moving to the left. Point number one is ingesting the truth, thinking the truth, processing the truth, the instruction, the training. And then from point one, we have an arrow to our second point, and that is living, living out what we have received. The Bible study hour calls that thinking and then acting biblically. That's point number two. Then a line, another arrow to point number three. And that is destiny. So it's thinking to living that determines destiny. What we think determines what we do and ultimately what we become is what we are destined to. Here's another way to think about that proposition. Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks, so is he. That's the idea. So here we have a proverb of a man, a fool, who never changes. We know that because look at the end. You will do so again. He is ungovernable. He cannot be corrected. Our top line reads, who incurs a penalty. The penalty here is really twofold from the Proverbs. First, it falls upon himself in that he loses his name and his reputation. We say, oh, you can't talk to him. That's the way we dismiss him. But it falls upon himself. Now he's isolated because he's ruined his name and his reputation. The name and reputation... How valuable are they? Well, the proverb says they're more valuable than silver and gold. And do you know? Do you know that the world proves that to us? It proves the proverb. Take some popular figure, a sports figure, and watch him soil his name, hurt his reputation. And what's the first thing that happens? The sponsors pull away. Why? Because they don't want to be identified with him. See, they prove the proverb. Uh, but there's also a second penalty here. Often he must make amends by payment, by compensation to repair, to cover over the damage that he's already done. Line two, surely here, your translation may read, a conditional if, the New American Standard reads, for if, if opens the second sentence with a real possibility. Look at this word, deliver. That word is used in 1 Samuel chapter 12 to warn the people of Israel not to trust in foreign idols. Here's the phrase. They do you no good, and they cannot, and here's our word, deliver. They can't rescue you. That's the idea. First Samuel, and what does it tell us about the word? 
that the word means it's weak, it's ineffective. And so look at our proverb. The closing, you'll do it again. He didn't listen, he didn't heed wisdom, the skill for living in the home, and now the consequences of the society fall upon him. It's dynamic upon him. That's actually what happened in 1 Kings chapter 1. Adonijah, who the Scriptures say his father David did not correct, rebelled against his brother who had become the king, and thus suffered punishment publicly as a result. There it is. Real life in history from the Proverbs. The incorrigible fool continues to repeat the same behavior and he will bear the brunt of his own punishment. So, what do the Proverbs teach? What are they exhorting us to? They are exhorting us to conform. Conform. Not to the world, but to wisdom. Embrace it. That's the proverb. Here's 20. Listen to counsel and receive discipline so that... Now, I don't know how your text reads... Uh, the NIV does not show the purpose clause. It's very emphatic in the inspired language. So that or that should be your second line. You may be counted among the wise in your final destiny. The wisdom, the skill for living does not come by taking a class or by listening to lectures, or reading a book. We listen to many wise instructors over time. We read the Scriptures, and over time, our hearts are made teachable. They are actually become softer, and wisdom naturally begins to flow into our soul. That's Proverbs 2.10. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. It's Proverbs 1.5, that the wise really increase. They gain. They learn wisdom and instruction. It's the idea of, of uh, Genesis chapter 12. God's call to our father Abraham. I will make, he says. I will make. I will make. What's he doing? He's refashioning the man. He's not only changing him from the inside, he's changing everything about his life. That's what progressive sanctification in the New Testament is teaching us. That we are, in fact, always progressing. may not feel like it, May not know it, but we are. After regeneration, becoming more and more like Him. And so, our thinking process has changed. Now, it will become your daily approach to life. The natural thing. You will know righteousness, fairness, equity, every good way. See, you think differently now. And you are different. The top line here opens with a command. There's really two in the proverb. Here's the first. The command that sets forth the condition. Look at this. Listen. A reminder to you and me that our faith is never seeing. It is hearing. You won't have Portraits of the Lord Jesus in the halls at Believer's Chapel. You will not have stained glass windows at Believer's Chapel. You will not light candles here or have incense here. Those things don't sanctify you. They don't change you. That's some kind of 
tactile experience for yourself, but they don't change you from the inside. Here's what changes you. And as long as the elders remain at this church, this is the way it's going to be. It's the Word. It's the Word. And the paramount Word of God on and over everything. Here's the way the Lord Jesus said it. Sanctify them in Thy Word. Thy Word is truth. You see, we set our lives on true north. That's the Word. So that's listening. Here's your second command. Counsel. The parents' loving admonition. It builds character. It quells waywardness in the child. To receive, here it is, the command. Take it in as it comes. It comes from 2 Chronicles 22, 29-22. 29-22, used of the priests taking the blood of bulls and the slaughtered goats. The idea, it's reflexive. That means it's responsive. When the animals were brought to the temple, they were used. Used for the sacrifice. That's the idea. Now, look. Discipline. Here in the purpose clause. Line 2. So that you may be counted among the wise, the skillful, one who is teachable, who stores up knowledge, who listens to instruction, who in, accepts the commands of the Word of God. We say to one another, boy, that text really beat me up. Or that, that message really convicted me. Well, you know what? That's healthy. That, that shows that the Word of God is refreshing that soul of yours. And it's a reminder by the power of the Spirit the work that is going on inside of you. That your life is really not in conformity to what the Word says. And so you have this natural feeling of guilt. And you say, oh, I really needed to hear that today. That's health. That's vitality. That's what changes you. Those are strokes of identification. Now you're on your way through life. And the proverb concludes your final destiny. Literally, it's your afterwards. That phrase is used 13 times in the Proverbs. It refers to the final outcome of a way of life. This is the end of the matter. This is the end for the righteous. Not your money. Not the size of your estate. No, you. You. The way you lived. The way you lived among us. We fed off of you. You encouraged us. You instructed us. You modeled the truth before us. And it was a great blessing to be with you and with your fellowship. That's what you left. Your manner of life is paramount. And now, the proverb says, you get to enjoy the things to come. When I have occasion to be with those who are dying, they have little time left, I try to make a point of reminding them of the things to come. Of what is next. I, I got this idea. It's interesting how the Lord works in your mind. I read it many, many years ago from Forbes magazine. It was about Bill uh, Gates taking Microsoft to the market and the negotiations that went on for several days with the investment bankers. And it had pictures of him 
in the waiting room, sitting outside as they haggled back and forth to come up with a price. And he would become the richest man in the world. And it just stuck with me. And then it dawned on me that Bill Gates and all of his wealth is a minuscule penance to what you have in Christ. And that's what I remind the dying. It's all in front of you. There it is. It's Christ. And it's His glory. This is what you've been living for. And I envy you. I envy you. Because now you're going to see it. And you're going to see Him. And it's going to be beyond anything you and I could ever imagine. You see, life here on this side of the Jordan, it's so uncertain. There's no certainty to anything. Why, look what a microscopic virus just did to our economy. Look how it changed everything and changed it suddenly. But these things, these things that we talk about in the Scriptures, they are certain. They are real. And they are sure. And you can bet your soul on it. Because He's the one who will never leave you or forsake you. He will never misrepresent anything to you. Light your life and your day on that. And it will change you. It's Jesus Christ. That's where you're headed. And to His eternal kingdom. And we'll all be together in fellowship with one another. And that's our final destiny. We learn it. And we live it. But one day, my friends, we will all walk in it together. Together. Here's 21. The plans of the heart of a person are many. But as for the counsel of the Lord, it will take place. We're many strategies of people in life. But it's only God's will that ultimately will come to fruition. The previous counsel of the parents that we just read about in the home, it's one and the same as the Lord's counsel right here in Proverbs 21. Oh, the money, the energy, the time, the effort that we devote to our children's education for the end result of what? That they can have good positions in life. And that's a good thing. Yet the proverb declares that it is this instruction from the Word of God that is paramount to everything. And it will, in fact, provide for the child the best life. The greatest life. That's discipline from verse 20. It makes for them the most success. Line 1, the plans of the heart of a person. Creative calculations. The process of the mind. Weighing decisions. This way, that way. Man proposes but it's God's will that rules the day. Then Pearl Harbor. Then 9-11. Then the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Then a pandemic. And everything changes. That's life here and now. Look at line two, the contrast. Here, the but. It strikes the antithesis to all of that. The plans of men. The contrast is the counsel of the Lord. You see that? It's a reference to His immutable will. One will. Contrary to the many wills of men in time and space. The fluctuation of men's minds. The top line reads, are many. 
Now look at the contrast in your proverb. But that's so important. What's the contrast to? The Lord. The name. The covenant name. The name of the burning bush. What do we know about that name? Here's what we know. It changes history. It comes into space and time and it changes history. My friends, if you're a shrewd investor, the time to short Egypt would be after Moses left that burning bush in the Midian desert. Uh, Egypt was at its zenith. And when God got through with it, this name, there wasn't much left. You see, what the name means is that He's reality. And we have a perfect illustration of that at Jacob at Bethel, Genesis 28. Remember, he's exhausted, he's running from his brother, he lays down and for a pillow he has a rock. He's so exhausted. And he sees that ladder in his dream, the angels ascending and descending. And he wakes up and he's a regenerate man. He's a, he's a different man. What's the first thing that he says? He says, surely God is in this place. What is that? It's the reality of a new life. He's born again. Looked like a rock among, among, among a bunch of rocks. Just a place. But not now. Not now. It's a place of worship. It's a holy place to Jacob. You see, God becomes a reality. He reveals Himself through His communicable and incommunicable attributes. That's what we learn about that name. He changes things. And you and I are the living proof of that, isn't it? Changed our history, didn't He? We're going one way, and suddenly, we all have our Damascus experience, don't we? He changes history. He changes life. Now, here is the substance of what this is all about. We learn about Him. And now we understand His will for us. The plans of man, their efforts, they may or may not come to pass, but here is what we can absolutely be certain of. His will. That's wisdom. The skill for living teaches us that. And by faith, we follow wisdom and it becomes a reality. And it will show itself every day to be true. For the past 20 some odd years, I have sent my son notes, and now I do by text, something that occurs in our society, something with a place, something with a person, and I put a proverb there, and I put the little epitaph, true every day. You see, because that's what you're learning. You're watching the ways of the wicked. You're watching the fools make fools of themselves. It's happening all around us every single day. Because you've heard the voice of the great shepherd and you have not diverted from the path of the righteous. You're walking in His way, which is the truth. And it's going to carry you to glory. And the world is falling apart. And it's falling away. How cheap they consider life. 
when we consider it so precious. And here's life, said Jesus, that you would know Me. Me! And the power that's inside of you. That's the resurrected power of Christ Jesus that transforms you, that changes you, changes your history, changes your destiny. Now you're on your way to the glory of God. You are incredibly rich because you belong to Him. And that's the proverb. We're out of time. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for uh, our time together in this, uh, the book that You created of wisdom, the way You fashioned the universe. You did it all by displaying Your truth to us. And we're grateful that we have ears to hear. We hear the voice of the Shepherd. And He leads us. And He cares for us. And He takes care of us each and every day. So use Your Word to remake us men and women, every one of us, to the glory of God. And for Your eternal purpose, Your will, not ours, Yours. Now bless us to that end that Christ may be glorified in us and through us. In Jesus' name, Amen.